Good morning. My name's Nathan. I'm one of the pastors here. Thanks so much uh, for joining us today. I um, want to make you aware of just a couple of things. Uh, first off, uh, Tom Hatton. Tom, where, where are you? Tom, if you don't mind, just stand up just for a second, just so y'all can familiarize yourself with one of our elders. Uh, Tom teaches our Old Testament foundations class. Um, we are not going to have that uh, the 22nd or the 29th. And the reason is Tom is going on a uh, medical mission trip to Nicaragua. Nicaragua. Sorry, I can't say that. Tried it today with Tom. And anyway, he is going to be conducting medical clinics. Tom is a medical doctor, and he is going to be conducting uh, medical clinics uh, in local small churches uh, in that area. Uh, we're super excited about how God's going to use him down there. Um, if you can just pray uh, for him as, he, as he's gone. He's leaving what day today, this week? Saturday. He's leaving Saturday, so he won't be here uh, Sunday. And then uh, I believe he has the opportunity in October to go to Uganda maybe, um, and so to do a similar thing. Um, and so if you have questions about missions, um, those are things that can, that can sometimes uh, be confusing. Hey, fill out an online care card or fill out a care card. Uh, Tom would love to talk to you about missions. I promise you. He's got a long, long, just, just a, a beautiful history. He and Carolyn both in, in missions in Haiti and around the world. And so um, just be in prayer about that. But please be praying for Tom and Carolyn uh, as he um, does that. So even though we're not going to have Old Testament, we will still have Huddle in here at 1015, um, that you're more than welcome to be a part of. It's just a great time of of building up our prayer group meets Monday at 530. And then we've got like almost 80 people showing up for groups on Thursdays and we're learning biblical uh, boundaries, which has been um, awesome. Um, it builds up the body. And speaking of uh, building up the body, you know, we are members uh, of a body. The moment you are converted, the moment you repent, place your faith in Christ for his atoning work on the cross, you are automatically a member of the body. Uh, you are commanded to build it up. Um, but if you, if you are a member here at Hendersonville Church or you aspire to potentially be a member uh, here, admittedly, Scripture is a little bit ambiguous on individual church membership, but we have an annual membership meeting, and we're going to have one on October 13th, um, where if you are interested in learning more about Hendersonville Church, Tom and Ryan and I, the three elders here, um, I will give a, a brief uh, history of the church, how God planted it, how God grew it, uh, how he decided um, to use someone who literally had no idea what he was doing. Um, I did, and I had no idea what I was doing. Um, but man, he used it, and he, and he, and he planted this church um, in, in spite of me. Um, and it's just been remarkable to see what God's doing here. And so uh, we'll also uh, share what we um, see as primary doctrine, what our core convictions are, so you can discern if you feel like this is uh, the church uh, that you are supposed to be building up uh, because you, you do realize you are supposed to be building up a church. I just want to make sure that's clear in the letters. Um, and so we're in uh, the letters of Peter. We're in Second Peter. We're only going to be covering verses three and four. Before we get into the message, um, <laughs> I want to have kind of a family meeting um, with, 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 the, with the people who are invested here. Um, if you're new here, uh, this doesn't really pertain to you, um, but uh, I just want to speak openly about something that's been uh, concerning me, uh, not just me, uh, the other elders and some other people here. Um, I want to start by repenting um, first because I feel like um, even though my intentions weren't to, I feel like maybe I've contributed uh, to this. Uh, I don't, no one's ever said that to me, but I feel convicted by God. So I want to repent to God and I want to repent to you um, because I feel like I've had some, some unrighteous anger. Um, it's been a long time, but folks, I've, I've just, I, I've, and they don't teach you this in seminary. Uh, I, I don't know really even how to talk about this, but I'm just going to kind of just share my heart, okay? But I've noticed more and more people coming in here late on Sundays. Um, our service starts at 11. Um, the purpose for this gathering, okay? The purpose for this gathering, it's not for you to get fed. Now, it is my job or who's ever job up here exegeting the word of God to feed you the word of God. It is, but that's not why you're here. You're here to worship your king. That's why we're here. We are here to, to, to worship our king. And folks, I know I can come across 
uh, strong. I've been praying. My wife, trust me, has been checking me on this. Um, Nathan, do not come across as shaming people or um, because listen, I got four kids. Man, getting up and, and getting ready is, it's hard. It is. Um, it's hard for this worship team to get here at eight o'clock on Sunday mornings to prepare to lead us in worship through song. Um, I don't wanna come across demeaning or, or legalistic, not condemning. Um, if you take it that way, I, I wanna apologize and I just ask you to have the spiritual maturity to come to me and give me the opportunity to repent for hurting you. But folks, we got an issue here because our king created everything. Our king came to this planet. He, he lived a humble life. And then he, he did ministry for three years. He was misunderstood. And then he went, he went to the cross and he became our sins on that cross. He became our sins on that cross. That's who we worship. He controls everything. He endured the worst physical torture for us. And again, the most important job of the church is to preach the word of God but to prepare our hearts and minds. And it's in Colossians, it's in Ephesians. If you wanna hear the specific verses, come see me afterwards. But we address one another and we address God with spiritual songs. And it prepares our heart to worship our King. And again, if, listen, if you got here late today because you had something crazy, listen, I, I literally wanted to preach this way. I, I watched a couple of people who covered this in, in their services because folks, I really didn't even know how to talk about this. But it's honestly, it's not about the, about the coffee or about the snacks. It's, it's, it's a heart issue. So I just want to ask, I mean, how, how often are we late to work? I mean, we're not, right? <laughs> and I'm just, I, I just, I, I, when it's a sin issue, the elders work to correct it immediately. This is not a sin issue. This is a distraction issue. And it distracts, and I'm, I'm not the only one that's noticed this. I'm not the only elder. I'm not saying a thing to you that I did not meet with Tom and Ryan on. And we prayed about this. I guess my question is, is who is God to you? Is he worth worshiping as your king? And I just, you know, if you want coffee and snacks, listen, I want to continue to provide those. Just be here at 1030 and fellowship. Man, the fellowship that's going on here between 915 and the Old Testament foundation. And what's cool is Tom and I see, and we don't plan it this way, but we see how the, his Old Testament teaching in Leviticus literally teaches the same thing as what Second Peter is because it all points to Jesus Christ and him crucified. It does. So ask yourself some questions because I, I really feel like it's a hard issue. It's not about the coffee. It's not about the, the snacks. It's not about... Where's the sense of urgency? Like, are you making a plan on Saturday night? Like, what must we do to get here? And again, I want to make sure, please, I don't know how my wife got here today with our two littles and got here on time. Man, they're hard, so please don't think, oh my goodness, if I, if I get there tomorrow at, or next Sunday, Nathan's going to be mad. It's not that at all. This has been going on consistently for years, and I feel like I've been in the lobby kind of just disrespecting God. Not intentionally. And I don't think any of it's intentional. But where's your heart? Folks, we're here to worship our king. We're here to worship our king. What does the Lord's day reveal to you? Because I want us, one, one guy that taught this to his congregation, he was as nervous as I am right now because I don't want anybody to look at me like I'm, like I'm being legalistic or you got to be here at 11 or you're not right with God. It's, it's not that at all. It's just, it's a heart issue. But we need to be eager, eager to show up here and build up this body in the beautiful aroma of worship to our King and to build it up. And we need to be expecting that God's going to do something. We need to be early. We need to be early. We're talking about Jesus Christ and him crucified. And again, if, if I've offended anybody, I just ask that you come to me and give me the opportunity to repent and seek your forgiveness because this has been weighing on me because I knew I needed to say something. I almost think maybe I was disobedient to God and not saying that sooner. And I don't think it was out of fear. I just, I didn't, because y'all know me. It's not like I really care about what people think about my preaching. I mean, I make that evident every Sunday. Amen. But 
But I just, let's, let's literally, let's evaluate our hearts as to what is crucial because the God of the universe is controlling every beat that is beating in this heart, in this room, and he could make them all stop right now. That's the king we worship. And so I hope I've not come across combative. If I have, I ask you to do the spiritually mature and the God commanded way of handling it and filling out a care card and let's talk about it. But I just want us to evaluate our hearts. And that's, and I wanted to repent because I feel like I have been part of the problem. I feel like I have, but we're here to worship our King. So let's worship him. Amen. All right. So, whew, okay. I'm glad that's over. Um, again, talk to me if you, if you disagree. If you agree, then do something about it. So, Second Peter, uh, one and two last week, we're covering verses three and four this week. Just so you know, the first 11 verses of First Peter is one continuous sentence in the Greek. Peter doesn't stop. A grammatical scholar would have taken issue with a run-on sentence, but it's almost like the Holy Spirit gets a hold of Peter in such a way that he cannot contain himself. And remember, he, he, he talks about knowledge of Christ, which he focuses on again, but he talks about in this verse three and four, some amazing things that he grants us, amazing things. And he starts out with the catalyst, the source, the reason, everything. The first three, verse, the first three words, his divine power. Now remember, who's he talking about right here? Jesus, our great God and savior, Jesus Christ. Now it's interesting, and you'll see this word again in verse four, because this word divine is only used three times in the New Testament, only three. And it, it, it literally was uh, kind of, it was here in verse three and four. And then the other time, Paul is talking to uh, the Greek scholars uh, in a place called the Areopagus in Acts 17. And what it meant was the deity of the pagan gods. Now, Peter's obviously not touching on that, but what Peter is doing is he is teaching that Christ transcends everything. And this is the word that he uses. It was, it was common to describe deities in paganism. And so um, he's addressing cultural concerns. And what Peter wants us to ask the question is the power of Christ alone, is it sufficient on its own to strengthen us and have us be able to endure temptations and trials when they come? And Peter's answer obviously is his power is more than adequate. It's more than adequate. He not only, Jesus not only sets the highest standards for us to live, he gives us the power to live it out. He's not asking us to do anything for which he is not equipping us to do completely. But I wanna make sure I understand this, that we understand this. Every single thing happens because of God's sovereign power. When Paul is writing the church in Colossae, he says, for by him, talking about Jesus, all things were created. In heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. Is there any confusion about the power of Christ here? No. Does he care about you? Well, man, Jesus is teaching his followers and he says it this way. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Ryan mentioned this in his message last week. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Folks, God knows the number of hairs in this room. He knows it. Nothing happens outside us. God is infinitely and totally sovereign over any and all circumstances. And by his divine power is how everything works. Well, what does his divine power does? Well, Peter teaches us. He says, it's granted us to all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, this is a tremendous, this is only the first half of verse three. This is a tremendous encouragement, but yet it is a significant warning because he's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. And one way you could word that is a godly life. He's given us everything. And you know, the, the issue is, is if we're not godly, if we're not living a godly life, you do realize there's only one person to blame. You, you see that person when you look in the mirror. 
we love to try to blame God for not making us godly enough. He's given us everything at conversion. And that's the, that's the part where Peter's going to hit on this word sanctification. Now, here's the issue. The word sanctification is a completely irrelevant word in our culture, is it not? And the, the word sanctification means to make holy. Well, unfortunately, holy is an irrelevant word. I mean, people, when they talk about something, they'll say holy mackerel or holy cow or something else. Um, no one really focuses on those words. Here's the thing. Those words, though, they're kind of like the medical terms that medical doctors use that while we may not care about them at all, our very life depends on their reality. For example, I may not use the word insulin, but if you're a diabetic, you are very, very conscious of the reality of insulin. I may not say epinephrine, but if I get bee stung, uh, my wife or Ryan, they're looking for an EpiPen real quick because I could lose my life. I'm deathly allergic to bees. So the sanctification holy is the same way. They're crucial words. And the problem is the modern church just doesn't teach them. And the problem is many people just want to believe that God's grace is for justification. At the time you pray that prayer and, and, and you are saved. And my prayer is, is that when you prayed that prayer, it was out of repentance and faith in Christ because that prayer in of itself does not save you. It is true repentance. It's a change of the heart. It's being reborn. But, and it is true though, grace does justify us. Make no mistake, Romans 3, it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So it is true, folks, his, his grace is justification. But folks, salvation is so much more. And we saw this in 1 Peter. These apostles were completely enamored and focused on sanctification and more importantly, glorification. And we're going to talk about that today. His, his grace is for our sanctification. Only God can make people godly. Like you realize that. Only God can make me godly. I can't do it on my own. I just got through talking to the students and talking about how we can't do it on our own. And man, I got to tell you, some of the stuff that they were saying, I was like, man, this is encouraging. I mean, clear evidence in our student ministry of, of sanctification. I was like, wow, okay, this is great. But folks, the church's goal should never be to make converts. Should never be our goal. God does that. Our, our, our goal should be to make disciples. That's it. Our disciples, not aim for converts, but aim to cause people to become more sanctified. That should be the aim of the church. That's the commandment in the letters. To be a people with, with a wartime mentality, in a wartime life. Like literally, folks, we're... Like, we're at war. Like, do you realize that? Like, we're in an all-out war that makes a potential physical World War III look like child's play. We're in a spiritual war. And that's where we got we to gotta start acting like this. But God's supply of spiritual power for us never fails. And it's funny where it says granted. This Greek word is to have completely granted, to have completely bestowed. It's in the present passive tense. And what that means is it is something that has occurred and it never stops occurring. It never stops. It occurs and it keeps on occurring and it never stops. It is a constant process with results. Are there results in your life of God granting you his grace? And it just, it's a common it's a common theme in, in the New Testament. God initiates, he sustains, and make no mistake, he will complete our holiness for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, praise his holy name. He will do it. He will bring it to completion because we produce good works, not because of ourselves, but because of God's sanctifying grace in our lives. And so, you know, some, the problem is, is I'm sure there's many in this room who are a child of God but they fail. And the problem is because of the lack of sound teaching that's in the modern church, they think, well, then there's gotta be something else. Uh, I gotta do more. I gotta give more. I gotta have a second blessing. I gotta have a second baptism, whatever that means. Or I gotta be able to do these things, heightened emotions or something. Here's the problem. That's due to a sheer ignorance of the scriptures. It is Jesus plus nothing. It is Jesus plus nothing. Otherwise it's legalism. It's works-based. 
And that's heresy. And look at what we've been granted. All things to life and godliness. Everything we have to live to righteousness and die to sin is given to us at conversion. Well, Nathan, how do you know that? Well, Paul tells the church in Ephesus that. Look what he says. Right out the gate. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with what? Some spiritual blessings? No. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Again, this is in the air's tense. It's already happened. We have everything. Praise God. We have everything to live a life that is honoring to God. We have every single thing we need to walk in godliness. God will not let you down. He is not capable of letting you down. The, the, when Paul's talking to the church in Corinth, he says, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God's what? He's faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, what will he do? He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Folks, God is faithful. He will not let you down. And I get it, it's challenging to walk out who we are, but I wanna show you how simple it is, okay? Because at salvation, there, there's three things I have, and they're the only three things I need to, to live a life that's honoring to God. Number one is God the Spirit. Folks, you realize when God draws you and you come to a saving faith of him and you repent and you place your faith in the atoning work of Christ on the cross, that he died for our sins, you are immediately sealed with the Holy Spirit. And no one or nothing can take that away from you. Scripture is clear on that. It is crystal clear. And I want you to, when Paul's talking to the church in Corinth, listen to what he says. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now listen to what he says to him in the very next verse. And such were some of you. Now what he's talking about here, he doesn't say that we're never gonna struggle with some of these sins. I'm sure every one of us in here are struggling with one of those sins. Well, I don't. What are you idolizing? Show me your calendar. I'll show you your idol. Maybe work. Maybe your family. Show me your checkbook. I'll show you your idol. I'll show you. But listen to what he says. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what? by the spirit of our God. Folks, he does it all. I have the Holy Spirit and Jesus teaches. You know, again, John 14, 15, 16, Jesus gives amazing teaching. And some of it's about the Holy Spirit. He says, but the helper, capital H, he's a person, he's God. The Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, he will what? Teach you all things. He'll teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. He says again in the next uh, chapter, he says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. By the way, most theologians and church followers, and I agree, this came out in the letters to the church. Because he's talking to the apostles who wrote Romans through Jude. But you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into what? All truth. He'll guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. I mean, folks, we have the Holy Spirit. And then listen to what Paul, when he's teaching Corinth, in the second letter, he says, and we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, we're gonna talk about this in just a moment, are being transferred into the same image from one degree of glory to another, sanctification. For this comes from what? From the Lord who is the Spirit, God the Spirit. Folks, we have 100% of him at conversion. That's why Paul says, but I say walk by the Spirit and you will not desire, or you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. You won't. We talked about this in our student ministry. We talked about the biggest word in the life of a Christ follower is surrender. Surrender. Surrender to God. 
and walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And this is actually, this next verse is one we hit on in our student ministry. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only is in my presence. And so it's, it goes back to, you know, if your boss is around, you want to check out social media. And so you're on your phone checking out who's saying what. And all of a sudden your boss comes, what do you do? You start shuffling papers, right? Paul's saying, hey, I've, I've been with you. Not only in my prep, man, much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, keep in mind, he's talking to the church here. So he's not talking about justification, is he? He's talking about sanctification. He says to work it out. But then he says, huh, it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. God gives us the desire when we spend time with him. He gives us the desire to be intentional, not to have good intentions. The students learn today that good intentions accomplish nothing. They, they don't. Are you intentional? And we came up with a couple of tangible things on how their week will look different this week than last week to help them grow in their relationship with Christ. And so it's just, it's, it's amazing. And then the other thing I have is God's word. I have God's word. You're like, well, Nathan, everybody's got God's word. No, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. If you're on the spirit, you can't interpret God's word. You can't. It'll seem like folly to the natural person. Paul's clear. But let's just make sure we understand what the word of God is. That's why we, we preach on the word so much is all scripture is breathed out by God <laughs> and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way. Folks, I'm not saying these pages and this, I think it's leather, is going to start flopping around and flying around. But when I'm in the spirit and I'm controlled by God and I'm in his word, I guess my question is, do you think that the writer of Hebrews here is talking metaphorical or allegorical? He's not. He's literal. The word of God is living and active. If you don't believe that, I don't know that you'd be a follower of Christ sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the vision of soul and of spirit. I bet I could bring Tom up here and he probably knows a lot of great surgeons, but I bet he doesn't know any that can pierce to the vision of soul and spirit. This does the work. Sometimes it hurts, it cuts like a knife of joints and of marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You want to have your mind transformed, get in God's word. It's why Jesus, when he's praying to his father in heaven, the night he's betrayed, John 17, man, the truth. And I, I kind of spent a lot of time in John 17 this past week and it'll come out my message, but I was like, wow, it's beautiful. He's praying for us. And he says, sanctify them in your truth. Well, what's truth? The word of God. And here's the thing, we'll make sure I'm clear. This Greek here is not an adjective. It's not like scripture here is some form of truth, but it is truth itself. And so what it implies here is God's word does not conform, conform to any other some type of truth. It is the only truth. Therefore, therefore, every other concept, every other belief, every other philosophy must be placed under it and set against it to see if it matches scripture. Scripture is the only truth in existence. You've got to understand that. It is the only truth. And that's a huge problem with the church is we want to, we want to take culture. And there's a massive movement where the, the church is allowing culture to, to change their viewpoints of scripture. Folks, if scripture calls something sin, it's sin. There's no getting around it. I don't care what culture says. We must submit everything in and through the word of God which we have. Praise God, he gave it to us. Thank him for his word. There's another thing I, that we have that, that God's given us. We've got the spirit, we've got the word, we've got God's people. And this is one we don't really tap into much, do we? I've got a, I've got a challenge with this. And I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to help y'all do it. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm seeing certain people, I'm gonna look up right here because they're laughing at me because they know exactly what I'm talking about because you know me but I've got, I've got this issue 
But folks, whether it's Acts 2, look at what they devoted themselves to. The apostles teaching, that's the word. And then what's the very next thing he mentions? The fellowship. Folks, the fellowship of the saints is crucial. It's crucial for more reasons than 10 to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And just a few verses later, listen to what happens. And day by day, attending the temple together, probably on time, but anyway, um, and breaking bread. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was joking, kinda. <clears throat> and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. What, what did God do? You want to evangelize? You want to see people come to Christ in a way unlike we've ever seen? Let's build up this body in love and watch it grow and the Lord will add to the number day by day those who are being saved, praise his holy name. That's what will happen. His word says it. It will happen. How are you building up the body? How, how are you doing it? Because Paul, when he gives, listen, if you have any shame, guilt, identity issues, please spend time with God in Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. Please. Paul prays some of the most beautiful prayers ever for you if you're his kid. But then in, in chapter four, he says, now it's time to walk out who you are. And he says to walk it out. And listen to what he says. Eager to maintain what? Unity. God calls the church to two things. Unity and purity. Folks, that's what he calls us to. That's why the writer of Hebrews, let us consider, just so you know, this Greek here is like a deep, uh, reflective thought where there's time and effort put into it. This convicted me. This convicted me. Let us consider what? How to stir up one another to love and good works. We're supposed to consider, we're supposed to reflect on how we're going to build up this body. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day dawning. Now, I was asking the students this morning, who do you have in your life that's kind of pulling you more towards Christ? And is there someone in your life that you're having to pull more towards Christ? Because here's the thing, you cannot pour out an empty cup. You can't. Who is pouring into you? Ryan taught me this. Are you isolated or are you insulated? And we're learning that in biblical boundaries on Thursday night. Here's the thing, folks, you're looking at a guy who lives in isolation sometimes. I, I, I just do. It's hard for me to let my guard down. I mean, I just... I did a little right here. I didn't like it very much either. But I knew I was supposed to. Are you isolated or are you insulated? Because God has given you one of the greatest gifts in his people, his body, his bride, the church. And that's why the writer of Proverbs says, iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. And again, it's like Ryan has said, it's gotta be at the right angle because if it's at the wrong angle, what will it do? It'll dull it. So how are you sharpening and how are you being sharpened? So look at, again, Nathan, is it this simple? Yes, it's not easy. There's a big difference between simple and easy. This is simple, boy, it's not easy. It's not, but at, salv at salvation, I have God the spirit. I have God's word and I have God's people. The question is, how much am I using it? And that's a big deal. How do we attain all this? Well, I, I get going, still on verse three. Through the knowledge, do you truly know Christ? Again, this is the same word he used in verse two. It's an intimate knowledge. It was used back then of a husband and wife, and it wasn't the physical intimacy. The problem is, and I think Ryan mentioned this, uh, the culture has, has kind of placed a, a, a negative or an or a altered definition of intimacy, Ask yourself this question, folks. This is the most important question you're probably gonna ask yourself. Do I only know about Jesus? Because trust me, the demons know all about Jesus. Or do I truly know him? Do you have a relationship with the God of the universe that adores you? And that's what he's talking about. So often today, people wanna claim a relationship with God and completely just not even worry about what the word says. They just disobey it. And I'm like, I... That doesn't make sense to me. And I, who am I to question anybody's salvation? But I mean, Jesus, John, James, Peter, Paul, all of them were clear. If you're saved, guess what there'll be? Fruit. There'll be fruit. There will be. 
And then Peter in super practicality, he says how all this happens. He called us. He called us to it, to his own glory and excellence. And what he's talking about there is God's effectual calling on our life where he calls us into a relationship with him. And this is beautifully laid out in Romans 8. In verse 28, Paul says, and we know that for those who love God, you can't love someone you don't know intimately. All things work together for good. Oh, wow. Yeah, hold on. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. There's the good. To be conformed in the image of Christ. Sanctification. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And then listen to this beautiful path that we're on as Christ followers. Those whom he predestined, he called. And those whom he called, he justified. And folks, since we're justified, what are we? Folks, we're glorified. Wow, that's just... We're, we're going to be, we're glorified saints. You need to understand that on your worst day, you are a glorified saint in Christ. And I don't care what culture, I don't care what your mom and daddy, I don't care what your boss says, you are a glorified saint in Christ Jesus, praise his holy name. You are, that's truth. And it's interesting, the two words that Peter uses with Christ, he called us to what? His own glory and excellence. It's interesting that Peter would choose these two words. Because let me tell you something. In scripture, glory only belongs to one person, God. That's it. It's from Genesis to Revelation. Glory belongs to God alone. Now we'll learn how we have access to that because he chose to give it to us, but it belongs to him alone. It's interesting, the, the song we just sang, Psalm 8. I almost want to sing this verse, but I won't. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Listen to what he says in Isaiah. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other. Now, what he's talking about here is he will not allow glory to go to anybody else. That's what he's talking about. So that's why he says, nor my praise to carved idols. Folks, God will not be mocked. He will not be mocked. And so it's just, Peter is again ascribing God's nature to Jesus, to Jesus. But hold on, he used another word, remember? And excellence. Now this is, this is super cool, at least I think it is. Because the Greek word excellence here, it's an excellence of moral character. And it was used to describe a, a person who was like a just a, a saint of a person. Uh, you may think of your grandmother as that, or you may think of a family member or maybe a, a former, pa I don't know, but man, th they could do no wrong. And so what Peter's doing now is he's bringing in Jesus's humanity into this. And this is crucial because again, folks, if Jesus is 100% God and 100% man, the cross does not work. It doesn't work. And so when you look at the writer of Hebrews, man, he unpacks this beautifully. He says, therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he may become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation. That means to satisfy the wrath of, to satisfy the wrath once for all for the sins of the people. People, For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. What are you being tempted with? He's faithful. He will help you resist the temptation of your flesh or the enemy or the world, he will. And the two chapters later, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet what? Without sin, he's perfect, excellent. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And then in chapter seven, it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. And even though he was this person, he went to the cross and became our sins. He did. It's just, listen, salvation's blessings and power. Listen, it only comes upon those who recognize the God man, Jesus. 
100% God, 100% man, because otherwise the cross does not work. He had to be fully God and he had to be fully man. And that's what Peter's doing here. And so then he, he informs us of what this glory and excellence do. And this, this verse four is a marvelous verse. I mean, the glorious implications in this verse, I mean, it's, it's next level. I mean, it, at first he said what he promises to grant us is, is everything to live a life that's godly. Now listen to the next verse on what he's granted us. <laughs> so by his glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us what? His precious and very great promises so that through them, you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world. Now, I'm just gonna give you a heads up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go fast, okay? I'm gonna go fast. So if you're writing, you may have to watch it again. But it's, it's the same Greek that's already happened with continuing results. And here's why the question is, we go through the next five minutes, which is gonna be drinking through a fire hose. I want you to ask yourself this question because this is the key to walking out who you are in Christ. It's focusing on God's promises. Do I focus on God's amazing and great promises to me? There's countless in the scriptures. And listen, if you wanna hear them, fill out a care card. One, one of our elders will reach out to him. We'll help you understand what his promises are. Cause he, is he gonna lie? Does anyone think God's a liar? Cause I need to talk to you after service if you think that. So his promises will always come true. And again, listen to these prom listen what, what these promises do. Folks, what do we become? And we got to handle this Greek and this verse with extreme care. Extreme care. There's been heavy debate over this verse, but this is a claim of almost unmatched glory because the Bible teaches that if we have God in us, folks, we get to share. <laughs> And I say this with reverence, in the qualities that are characteristic of God himself, we are, we are partakers in the divine nature of God. And I want to, partakers is a, a partner, a sharer, a fellowship. And it's, it's incredible. And this is taught throughout scripture. It's just, we, want, we don't want to realize who we are in Christ. I mean, Paul says, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs, according to promise. He says to the church in Ephesus, and this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And then John in his letter, he makes this abundantly clear. This is incredible. Beloved, we are God's children now. Are you God's kid? Are you? And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know. And when he appears, what, 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 what does it say, folks? Folks, we're gonna be like him because we shall see him as he is. That is mind-blowing. I almost took out my knee right there. That, that's mind-blowing. We're gonna be like him. And look, again, Peter's not mincing words here. Divine nature. It's that same Greek word that he wants these pagans to understand. Oh, well, let me tell you something. There is one God, only one, Period. And the, the nature and the, and the state of being God. Now, again, to my point, early theologians, they got nervous about this because some people were taken out of context and there's some people that wrongfully teach their heretics that we become like gods. Well, that's not what Peter's saying at all. He wants to know that we are gonna be partners in the very life that belongs to God. We have his character. And you gotta understand, I'd much be, rather be the character, have the character of the one doing the judging then have the character of the ones being judged. Think about that. Which character do you have? I mean, because Romans 8, man, <laughs> Paul makes it clear. If, if anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Folks, we're sealed. Again, we have the Holy Spirit. And then a verse that I always say with reverence because of what it says. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God. Folks, the way this Greek is, Paul places us when Christ comes in his glory to be fellow heirs with him. So somehow, some way, God in his sovereignty and his grace and his mercy, he chooses to make us like Jesus, and then I want to real quick just go through. There's some things we have in Christ. 
Folks, we gotta focus on these or we cannot walk out who we are in Christ. We can't. Number one, I have his eternal life. Folks, in Christ, you have his eternal life. This is so clear. John says, and this is the testimony that God gave us what? You have eternal life in Christ, eternally. I mean, that's, that's mind-blowing. But he says, whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. The next thing we have, folks, we have his eternal riches. I get it. Man, some people wanna focus on man, what's my next house gonna be? I want this land, I want, I want a nicer car, I want, I want this, I want that, I want my portfolio to be a certain way. Folks, we have eternal riches in Christ Jesus. The two richest men in the world, I ain't gonna say their name. They got nothing compared to what my father has. Folks, and it's coming. His glory's coming. I mean, Paul prays in Ephesians, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know. What is the hope to which he has called you? What are the riches of his glorious inheritance? What? Who are his saints? I rarely, rarely ask anybody to raise their hand. But you know what? If you're a saint of God, raise your hand. If you're in Christ, you are. You're a royal priest. Man, you've got it all. Next, I have his eternal power. Now keep in mind, it's his power. It ain't yours. It's his when Paul's writing to the church in Colossae, he explains this. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of what? His will. Jesus only did one thing, will the Father, in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So watch his pathway. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Is that not exactly what Peter's talking about? Fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit, in every good work and increasing in the knowledge. There's that same intimate knowledge of God being strengthened with how much power? All. Folks, we have it. The problem is we don't live like we have these amazing blessings from God in Christ Jesus, as if it can't get any better. Folks, I've got his eternal love. Again, you wanna get your heart lifted? Read, read John 17. And look at the unity and the, the beauty between Jesus and his, and his father in heaven as he prays for his kids. I mean, it's just amazing. But Paul talks about this. Paul knows that he's got this love. And listen what Paul says. I am sure, this Greek word, just so you know, it's, it's certain. Bet the farm on it. That neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord, praise his holy name. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing. You have it. And when Jesus is praying to his father, he says, the glory that you have given me, I've given to them. We'll get to that in the next one. That they may be one, even as we are one. Unity, I and them, and you and me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Folks, on your worst day, your worst day, you chew out your boss, you're mean to your spouse, you're mean to your kids, you look at that on whatever. Listen, on your worst day, if you are in Christ, God loves you as much as Jesus I say that with reverence, but that's what Jesus prays right here. He prays it. Does he pray perfectly in accordance to the will of the Father? Yes. And because of all that, folks, I have his eternal glory. I have his eternal glory in the way he deems fit to give it to me. Again, in that first section, the glory you've given me, I've given to them. Folks, this is, these two verses right here, man, just, just, just read these. Just fall in love with them. Rest in them. Pray them back to God. God, let me realize this because in Christ, folks, and Peter's gonna get into this. He's gonna get into some hard, hard teaching. He's gonna start talking about false teachers. He's gonna start talking about things that are gonna be very seemingly offensive. Folks, if we're not focused on this, we're not gonna get what 2 Peter's doing. You've gotta focus on this. You have his eternal life, his eternal riches, his power, his love, his glory. Do you realize it? Because until you realize it, you cannot. And that's why Paul ends 
his second letter to the Corinth, to the church in Corinth, he says, examine yourselves. We can take that in our current culture to examine our checkbook, examine our calendar, examine our whole life to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Do you realize that? Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. Folks, we got to stop this watered down teaching of the gospel. Are you in Christ? Are, are you in Christ? Because when we realize these, we've escaped from the corruption. It's interesting, this Greek word corruption, it was, it was used to describe a, a moral decay, but it was also used to describe a, a decomposing organism and the accompanying stench that comes along with it. That's what, that's what they're using here. And that's why John says, all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, it's not from the Father, but it's from the world. Pride is so sneaky. It is so sneaky, folks. It creeps in. <laughs> and that's why when, when, when Paul's talking about the way the lost people used to walk in Ephesus, he says in Ephesians 4, he says, but that's not the way you learn Christ exclamation point, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is what? It's corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in righteousness and holiness. You can't do this if you're not abiding and focusing on it. And I, I tell you, one of my favorite verses is Galatians 2.20. I would memorize it and I would pray it to God because Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me and the life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Folks, in a, in a culture we live in, where it's this me-centric stuff, where we can have you know, our own revelations, or we can have this. Folks, we gotta focus on the truth. And the truth is when you are saved, you have God the Spirit. You have God's word and you have God's people. You have it. And then Peter's wanting us to understand that in Christ, we have so many promises of his eternal life, riches, power, love, and glory. Without this, Walking it out will not work. We've got to focus on who we are in Christ. Because I'm telling you, and you can read ahead. It's not like I'm a spoiler alert, okay? You know what I'm gonna preach on. It's gonna get hard with Second Peter. Well, I thought First Peter was hard. It was. Second Peter's just as hard, and in some cases, harder. But folks, if we're in Christ, man, the, we gotta focus on the promises of who we are. Because when we focus on who we are in Christ, we automatically start walking it out by the power of the Spirit. Are you interested in that? Fill out a care card, talk to somebody. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for this time. God, I just pray, God, that we would, we would just focus on your great promises that you granted to us You've granted us all things necessary to walk this out with you. You've granted it to us. You've freely bestowed it upon us. It's done. It's finished. We have it. We fight from victory. God, let us focus on it. It's, it's how the early church exploded under extreme persecution. It was just a handful of people and it exploded because they knew who they were in you. And so God, I pray that for the believers here. And God, for someone who's not sure, who doesn't recognize any of these truths, who say, man, I don't think that applies to me. God, please just have them fill out a care card or grab somebody or grab me afterwards. Um, and God, I just, I just pray that you will continue to sanctify us with the power that you grant us. Give us the desire and the intentionality to walk it out. In Jesus' name, amen.